Hello, this is Mitch Brinks. I'm the chair of Vision 2020 USA, here to conduct an interview as part of our ongoing uh, series of interviews on the subject of telehealth and big data. Our interviewee today will be Dr. Michael Chang, uh, who is now the director of the NIH's National Eye Institute as of late 2020. Uh, Dr. Chang was formerly a practicing ophthalmologist at the Oregon Health and Science University, where he was the professor of ophthalmology, medical informatics, and clinical epidemiology. Uh, Dr. Chang has a long history of national and international leadership in the field of telehealth, big data analytics, and artificial intelligence, and he looks to bring those strengths to further the NEI's work in the field. He is here today to share with us a few thoughts about the research that's gone on in the field and where the direction of research in telemedicine, big data, and artificial intelligence might go in the coming years. Thank you for your time. Uh, okay, Dr. Chang, um, can you tell our audience a little bit about your background and what led you to become involved in research in the fields of telemedicine, um, image analysis, and informatics? Um, yeah, Mitch, sure. It's, um, it's a you know, interesting, at least to me, story. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a house where almost everybody was an engineer. Uh, and so I, I grew up sort of assuming that when people grew up, um, uh, they became engineers. And, and so I went off to college and studied electrical engineering. Um, you know, I love doing it, um, uh, but for various reasons, um, uh, became interested in applying technology toward the practice of medicine. Um, and I actually thought I'd become a physician and then um, uh, build uh, machines that treated things like cardiac disease. Um, and, uh, and so I went off to medical school, basically. Um, but at the time, this was the early um, uh, to mid-1990s, uh, um, one of the really hot topics was um, uh, computational neuroscience, uh, neural networks. And they were really hot back then. And they became very unhot, you know, for a while, and now they're ironically hot again. Um, but mm -hmm. I had this vision um, uh, back then, gosh, maybe I can become a neurosurgeon. I can uh, uh, learn how the brain works and operate on it and model it using computers. And um, I looked, um, you know, I thought I wanted to work in a lab that did research in this area. And um, uh, you know, this was in Boston, Massachusetts, and I, I met a guy, um, Dick Masland, uh, who was working in the Division of Neurosurgery Research at one of the hospitals in Boston. And uh, yeah, I worked with him. He was doing um, uh, sort of uh, uh, neuroanatomy and physiology, and it happened to be in the rabbit retina that he studied. And so that's when I learned about visual neuroscience, and that's what made me become an ophthalmologist. Um, okay. And so, uh, uh, and so I. I went into residency, and as a resident in ophthalmology, um, uh, this was at Johns Hopkins in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, everything was paper-based. Um, all the notes, all the uh, CAT scans, um, you know, film, uh, it was all paper and film. Uh, and so that made me interested in data management. And I thought, well, gosh, I, I don't know if the world needs more people who build devices. You know, I thought maybe we need people who manage data. And that got me interested in the field of informatics. Um, and I thought at the time, uh, maybe I can build my career um, using that. And uh, that there was so much work that could be done creating basically an electronic infrastructure for vision science and for eye care. And uh, but beyond that, I, I really didn't know specifically what I would do or what my niche would be. Uh, that's a very broad um, topic. And, uh, and so I really, at the time, spent, you know, literally hundreds of hours trying to learn about this. And during that time, uh, met three people. Um, one of them was named Ted Shortliff. And he was a really seminal figure in the field of biomedical informatics. Um, and he had started the program in informatics at Stanford and then moved to Columbia about a year before. And the second um, was Justin Starin. And Justin, at the time, uh, was involved with one of the biggest telemedicine projects that had ever been funded outside the U.S. military. Um, uh, it, it was home um, diabetes care. So it had nothing to do with ophthalmology, but there was a lot of infrastructure um, involving telemedicine. And the third was John Flynn, who was a pediatric ophthalmologist who had done some uh, enormously um, uh, impactful work involving ROP, a retinopathy of prematurity. And all three of them, um, uh, two of them had just moved to Columbia University a year before, and Justin Starin was already at Columbia. 
And so that made me think, gosh, there'd be some amazing things if I started my career there. And so in New York City, and I wrote my first grant, which was a K grant um, uh, called Telemedicine for RLP Diagnosis. And, uh, you know, we did some uh, uh, really fun work that time, basically building telehealth systems for RLP, um, you know, trained nurses to capture photographs, built systems to collect the data and to analyze it. And um, at the same time, uh, got involved with a lot of American Academy of Ophthalmology um, medical information technology activities, um, got involved with some very early electronic health record activities at my own institution. And during all that, you know, led a number of um, uh, projects in that area involving healthcare IT. Okay, that led to more and more research involving EHRs. Okay, I got involved um, in uh, uh, so-called big data projects like the AAO's Iris Registry Project. And, uh, you know, this is now sort of a decade of work sort of compressed um, into these few sentences. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, by this time had moved to Oregon. And um, you know, really had the privilege of uh, you know mentoring um, a scientist in ophthalmic informatics, Michelle Rybar, uh, who's eventually become a really great collaborator. We built up a program involving data analytics and data science using electronic health record data. Um, but but anyway, um, coming full circle, you know, I really um, you know started some of that telehealth work um, at Columbia, uh, moved to Oregon, where I spent the next ten career. And, um, you know, we really did some work. The original area of my research, which was telehealth for ROP, um, sort of evolved. Okay, I met a superb um, computer scientist collaborator in Boston, okay, Jay Sheree Kalpathy Kramer, uh, who's really become one of my closest collaborators. And we evolved that program in ROP into artificial intelligence. Um, and we built up systems that have really, um, you know, recently received FDA so-called breakthrough status. And, you know, with that, part have, um, have helped to mentor uh, another really superb clinician scientist, Pete Campbell, um, you know, who's now become a really close collaborator. And you know, I guess, you know, uh, Mitch, to answer, to finish answering your question, um, also coming full circle, um, in the area of informatics, um, I, I mentioned the name Ted Shortliff, uh, who was um, one of the people who I originally went to Columbia to work with. He did informatics. And um, He'd always taught introductory informatics to first year PhD students and postdocs, um, uh, you know, originally at Stanford University and then at Columbia. And when I started um, uh, on the faculty at Columbia, um, after finishing an informatics fellowship there, um, I, um, uh, Ted asked me to co-teach his informatics course with him. And uh, that was an amazing experience. It gave me a really broad perspective on the field. And, um, you know, when Ted left Columbia to move on, his next position, I took over teaching that and, um, you know, have become sort of the associate editor of, of his textbook in informatics now. And I, I really love that to get a perspective on the field holistically. So I, I guess I finish up by saying that, you know, I really, um, to directly answer your question, I started off wanting to do informatics very broadly um, uh, and then really started my career uh, using telehealth for RLP as that starting point and okay, moved into artificial intelligence and I've really, um, I think, been fortunate to develop a pretty broad perspective on how telehealth fits into the overall framework for informatics and also the overall healthcare landscape um, in this country. So, so it's been enormous fun. And I think that there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. Mm -hmm. What an interesting story, Mike. It sounds like you have uh, many, many uh, collaborators and many people that have mentored you and helped you along the way to achieve your successes. Uh, you know, your long history of involvement in the field of, of telehealth and informatics probably gives you a pretty good perspective. And I was hoping you could take a minute or two just to kind of tell the general vision health audience uh, what the, the, the historic pattern of growth in telehealth has been. As you said, um, there must be some involvement with transfer of paper-based records to electronic health records. That's probably what most people are familiar with. But what have been the, the kind of... Uh, rising patterns of the growth of this field over the last 10 or 20 years? How would you describe that? Yeah, Mitch, that's a, that's a great question. <laughs> it's a complicated question. Um, you know, I think that um, uh, this is obviously an exciting time and there are enormous changes um, in the field. I think one of the insights that I've had um, about telehealth overall is that, you know, the premise is really not new um, at all. 
Um, you know, one thing that was really interesting for me to learn about was that um, uh, in the 1960s, there was a project in Boston, okay, the Logan Health, uh, the Logan Airport Telemedicine Project. Uh, uh, the idea was that there used to just be one tunnel that connected the airport to the rest of the city. And, you know, it was really hard for ambulances to get through that tunnel during rush hour. And so um, a group of investigators in the 60s set up a telehealth system where there'd be a um, a, a local contact at the airport uh, who would be, for example, a doctor or a nurse who would take patients who got sick at the airport and take histories and do basically physical exams on them. And they'd be connected uh, through, I don't remember if it was microwave or satellite technology, um, in real time to the subspecialist who was back at Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, and so they could converse basically about the findings uh, and you could give a remote diagnosis. Uh, really not that different from what we think of as real-time uh, video conferencing now. Um, and this was the 60s. And, um, you know, what they really showed back then was that those systems could work and that you could get the right diagnosis, uh, you know, with remote consultation. But with that system, as well as with many other sort of demonstration projects at the time, they worked through the Indian Health Service, uh, through Alaska sort of remote demonstration projects, um, uh, those systems could work, even with those limited technologies. Now, because this was the 60s, sometimes the technologies didn't always work okay, the way that they might right now. But um, but on the other hand, what didn't work was, um, uh, for example, with the Logan Health Project, uh, you've got to get uh, a patient, a nurse or doctor at the airport together. You've got to get a remote consultant together at the same time. Uh, you've got to get people to run the technology and schedule the visits, uh, you know, often at the same time. And it was those logistics um, uh, that made it really tough to sustain. Um, and it's, um, it's things like, well, how do you make things economically self-sustaining? And a lot of projects, in fact, almost all the projects that I'm really aware of um, at the time, uh, really just died out after their initial grant funding uh, ran out. And that's really been an interesting uh, sort of thing for me to reflect on over the years that, um, you know, it's really now in 2021, easy for people to talk, well, let's do this telehealth thing. But, you know, sometimes when I think back to Logan Airport in the 1960s, uh, you know, sometimes I wonder, well, is what's being proposed right now different, you know, from that, you know, aside from the fact that we're using different technologies and when it's not, sometimes it makes me wonder, well, is it going to succeed or not? Um, another yeah. interesting sort of um, historical lesson for me, if you will, um, Mitch, has been that if I look at some of the things that really have been successes um, in telehealth, um, they're going to be things like the military. Um, uh, during Desert Storm, uh, there was some really interesting teleradiology work. And I think the premise of that is that uh, it's difficult to send doctors out to the battlefield. And so, you know, cost effectively, uh, you know, or, or just logistically, some of it had to be done remotely. Um, in, uh, in systems like the prison system, uh, telehealth has been, um, you know, really successful. And I think that that, that goes both ways, that um, sometimes it's logistically hard to get clinicians to the prison system. And sometimes one interesting thing that I found is that people who are in prisons don't always want to leave prisons and, you know, go to doctor's offices in chains and orange jumpsuits. It, it's just, it's just not, you know, you know, people just don't really like that. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, and also, um, uh, and so the, the thing that I've learned from it is that um, when there's a, a model for doing that, that makes sense, I've been impressed that people um, uh, can figure out a way to do that. And I think that that's something that we've seen with COVID. Um, that when patients couldn't um, uh, get into doctor's offices and when doctors and staff couldn't get into doctor's offices, and that was often the impetus for trying to figure those things out. And so I think historically, um, you know, one interesting thing is that, you know, it's not new and that we really need to find those areas where it's, um, where there's a real need that needs to be solved using the technology. And then, you know, I think that those are the things that we can really address using uh, using telehealth and informatics. Yeah. That's interesting. I'm sure there's there's a lot of lessons in the the 
COVID uh, pandemic has really changed the playing field in terms of telehealth and how people think about it. Um, so, so here in 2021, um, you know, the, the technical resources and capacity and, and maybe the kind of general society's perspective on telehealth uh, is hopefully probably different than it was in the 60s or even 10 or 15 years ago. Um, but in the technical side of things, uh, what are the questions that are being wrestled with as you look at research projects around the country? What are the, the main questions that people are facing and trying to answer? Um, how would you describe that in kind of a, a survey almost of, of those different questions people are struggling with as priority topics? Um, <clears throat> Mitch, I think the place that I would start to in answering that would be, um, you know, I used to lecture on telehealth back in the uh, mid 2000s. I mean, we had a slide that was basically called something like unanswered questions involving telehealth. And mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, for many diseases, uh, maybe even for most diseases, some of those unanswered questions in the mid 2000s are still unanswered. Um, but let me just um, talk about a couple of them. Uh, one of them most basically is going to be, does it work? I mean, can you get the correct diagnosis uh, by mm -hmm. remotely? Uh, you know, and of course, that raises other questions in terms of well, what is the correct diagnosis, <laughs> and you know, how do we know? Um, and but but I think number one, you know, we've got to prove that telehealth works in terms of pure diagnostic accuracy. Um, uh, you know, I think that there are other workflow questions sort of along the lines of the Logan Airport Telehealth Project. Um, is it efficient? Uh, do those systems work within a normal clinical workflow? Um, can you train people like doctors and nurses and technicians and other staff um, adequately to use those um, technologies? You know, of course, there are questions involving um, data security, data privacy, that I think are legitimate um, uh, uh, research questions uh, from an informatics uh, perspective. Of course, there are questions involving interoperability of data okay, from these um, uh, systems, and how do you get them into the normal clinical workflow? And you know, how do you get decision makers, okay, doctors, nurses, technicians, that data when they need it? They're okay, setting up systems of care. Um, you know, ultimately, I think one of the questions is: um, Are these systems cost effective? Yeah, compared to what we do right now. And cost effective is a very broad term, you know, involving things like uh, cost of care, access to care. Um, but I think that um, at the end of the day, um, for many physicians, uh, well, for many clinicians, without knowing the answers to those questions, um, you know, I think clinicians are left wondering, well, why should I implement, you know, these things without knowing that they work or that, they're, uh, that they um, are efficient? And, um, you know, from a health systems perspective, um, uh, payers, um, you know, may not be willing to pay for these if there's not demonstration that they're cost effective. Uh, and so I think that um, uh, the impetus is really on the research community to come up with answers to those questions to inform sort of decision making, um, uh, economics and really policy making um, overall. And I guess I um, finish up, Mitch, by saying sort of um, the obvious that in the era of COVID, um, there was that need um, in the sense of um, you know, doctors, uh, patients not being able to make it into the office or not being afraid to go into the office and staff and uh, uh, physicians not being able to go in because of physical distancing or other, um, you know, other other issues. And so the comments, um, you know, comments have been made around the community that in a lot of ways, um, uh, you know, we as a community have made more progress um, within the past few months uh, than, within the past, than within the past few decades in telehealth because of that real need um, that came up. And also the fact that the government did pass legislation to reimburse um, for telehealth. Um, and I think that it remains to be seen um, whether uh, those things are going to, whether those changes are going to persist. Um, I think one of the challenges that I've really seen, especially in a field of, you know, a field like eye care, um, has been how do you collect data? Um, typically, eye care data come from devices like uh, slit lamps and ophthalmoscopes, but they also come from tonometers, um, uh, cameras. 
OCT devices. And um, to what extent does that translate to telehealth? And are there, for example, portable devices uh, that can be used by optometrists, by general ophthalmologists, or primary care doctors, uh, or even by patients, uh, where there's where those data can be collected um, closer to the patient, you know, if you will, and then sent to some specialists. But I, I think that those are areas where um, uh, uh, there may be room for innovation in the future. Mm -hmm. Interesting. It's an exciting field that, that indeed has got a lot of attention, even out here in Oregon, I think at every uh, university across the country and probably every clinic, um, all of the uh, healthcare practitioners, patients, and ophthalmologists specifically have thought a lot about how this might play a role in our past pandemic and future pandemic and in a general sense. Uh, you know, uh, Vision 2020 USA um, and its associated organ organizations are pretty engaged in, in trying to address uh, uh, eye care disparities and, and really kind of have a public health uh, lens on delivering eye care to the greatest number of people in the country. And, and there are certainly challenges to do that generally and have been, you know, uh, for the past uh, uh, 20 years that I've been working in the field. And now that uh, telemedicine and, and big data uh, have come to the fore as possible answers to some eye care questions, I've heard some questions, some concerns raised that that this technology uh, should best be stewarded to make sure that it it's, doesn't exaggerate those disparities, that it actually can address those disparities because the disparities come from uh, challenges to in-person uh, eye care. Uh, what comments would you have about you know the way we should think about uh, technology and eye care and how it can be delivered to make sure that uh, Eye care disparities are addressed as a priority in, in the future. Yeah, Mitch, I, I agree that this is a really important uh, problem and that there are real challenges um, in this. I think that it's, um, uh, to state the obvious, I completely agree that we have significant um, uh, disparities in this country uh, regarding access to eye care and really health care overall. Um, and I would also sort of preface my answer by saying that um, technologies like telehealth, um, I personally view as mechanisms for deliver, delivering healthcare, uh, not really as innate technologies per se. Um, in other words, um, I view the clinician practicing telehealth as being practicing medicine. And you know you're delivering care, and it just happens to be that you and the patient are not in the same uh, place. Uh, mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I know it's a little bit of a subtlety, but um, I think I, I, my personal opinion is that it's important to think of these technologies as a mechanism for delivering care, not as technologies in and of themselves. Um, mm -hmm. But so, um, Mitch, I, I think that. To restate your point, um, I, I definitely think that there are uh, ways that we can use technology as a mechanism for improving accessibility uh, to uh, eye care and to healthcare overall. Um, uh, you know, you know, you know more better than almost anybody um, else that uh, one of the real challenges um, uh, to healthcare access in this country is for people who live in rural areas. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I think that there are similar challenges for people who live in urban areas. Well, there are, there are, there are other challenges uh, for people who live in urban areas. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, hopefully technology can part, be part of a solution uh, to, those, um, uh, to those problems. Um, I, I definitely do um, uh, agree that if we rely on technologies as a part of the solution, um, and, you know, that technology could be, um, you know, some imaging machine, it could be some home monitoring device, computers, um, uh, that that has potential to widen the gap uh, between the so-called haves and the have-nots um, in our society. Um, and we need to um, be coming up with ways to use those technologies to narrow the gaps. Uh, rather than to widen uh, those gaps. And I, I feel um, uh, heartened at, um, 
having seen a few cases where technologies um, uh, have been used to narrow those gaps. Um, you know, there was a great New York Times article, um, you know, years ago about a 15 year old um, in Mongolia uh, who discovered MIT open courseworks and became one of the top ranked um, students in their electrical engineering um, courses through that. <laughs> and, um, and you know, you know, presumably those things would not have happened without access to uh, technology, which in that case was a computer and a web browser. Um, <laughs> and so I, I do think that that's um, uh, possible because we've all seen it happen. Um, and, I, and I also um, uh, think in terms of um, the different groups, um, you know, in this country that, um, you know, there are different, uh, you know, racial, ethnic groups, um, you know, genders. And um, in terms of technologies like artificial intelligence, um, you know, I think it's important. Another aspect of this um, in terms of disparities is just keeping in mind that when we develop these technologies, um, uh, they have to work for everybody. You know, they can't just work in the population that, um, uh, uh, that they were first tested in. And then, of course, we're seeing that now with um, vaccines in COVID, but in artificial intelligence, uh, we've been dealing with this problem for years where um, you've got to validate it in different um, uh, populations. And so I think these are all different pieces of the fact that, you know, we really have to um, uh, uh, think of technology as a mechanism for um, improving uh, accessibility to care. But I think there's enormous potential in doing this. Yeah. Well, we in our coalition really appreciate your sensitivity and and obvious thoughts you put into those issues, um, you know, both in the past and moving forward. Um, you know, and that brings us to the last question I wanted to run by you, Mike. Um, you know, you you have a, a leadership position um, directing research in the U.S. and obviously in a wonderful background in, in telemedicine, and informatics, um, and big data. Um, and now I think the community would be really interested to, to hear what your sense is uh, you know, I mean, you're even though you have a leadership position, you're just one person, and there's the whole research community in the U.S. and globally. But, but uh, what would you paint as the ideal picture of research in these fields moving forward? Would it be more cooper cooperativity, more data sharing, uh, just kind of more focus on the practical side of uh, implementing telemedicine, or how do you think these these features of research moving forward? Uh, would move forward in an ideal scenario. Um, Mitch, this is a great question. Of course, it's a very tough question. Um, and mm -hmm. I, um, I think that um, one of the things that I've appreciated more and more just from uh, being a scientist and being a clinician um, is that I think that the delivery of medicine, uh, I think, involves uh, science, it involves art, and it involves technology. And um, it's been really um, fascinating for me throughout my career to see the interplay among those three things, science, art, and technology. Um, and I think that as scientists, it's easy to get washed away and the science and the technology part of that. But um, I think it's really important. And I, I've seen how the art of medicine really plays into the delivery of care. You know, so we're talking about um, uh, things like telehealth and um, informatics. I think it's important to remember the art. Um, uh, I would say that as I look at our healthcare system um, uh, and my piece of it is eye care, um, you know, one thing that has struck me um, is that um, eye care is often subjective and it's qualitative. Um, you know, what we do in eye care is that you look at morphology and then we come up with diagnoses based on that. Um, uh, and, you know, I started my career at ROP. Is this plus disease or is it pre-plus disease? Um, you know, somebody in diabetes will look, well, gosh, is this really a dot blot hemorrhage? Is this severe diabetic retinopathy? Is it, you know, you know mild? Uh, proliferative retinopathy, um, you know, is that ulcer? How bad is it really? It looks angry. What does it mean to look bad? Um, and, I, you, know, I, I, you know, I've seen and been struck 
um, you know, how much subjectivity there really is um, uh, in clinical eye care. And it's kind of what we all do. We all know that. And we all know that mm -hmm. uh, you go to some doctors, uh, you know, you know, some of us will be aggressive, some of us will be conservative in terms of you need surgery versus you need observation. And um, mm -hmm. uh, those are, uh, and I think that, um, uh, you know, we're seeing now uh, where technologies and science can help improve that. And it can be through um, uh, genetics. It can be through, you know, artificial intelligence, some combination. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I'd envision to answer your question is going to be, um, you know, Mitch, sort of that the science and technology, regardless of what it is, is going to lead to higher quality of care for patients. And the, depending on your disease and the science or the technology, there can be a million ways of doing that. But I, I also hope that it leads to um, a, a better uh, standardization of care, meaning that um, uh, we're not going to get to people who look at the same thing and say, oh, this is mild versus this is severe, which, which we do see now because of that subjectivity. Um, uh, I hope it improves um, uh, things like accessibility um, uh, care for the reasons that we've talked about. And, um, but I also think that um, it, I, I hope that it's a way to let doctors um, uh, focus uh, more and more on doctoring and on the art of medicine. Um, that, you know, almost all doctors that I know of went into this uh, you know, went into the field because they want to take care of people. And, um, mm -hmm. and sometimes as a practicing clinician, you know, I, I think that there are cases where people feel like they're washed away and clicking check boxes or, um, you know, copy pasting text. And um, mm -hmm. I hope that to the extent that we can learn things about, you know, for example, the genetic or the physiologic basis of disease or the, uh, uh, you know, applications for artificial intelligence to make a more accurate diagnosis. Um, if that can, you know, in clinical care, you do a couple things. One of them is that you tell patients what's your diagnosis. And the second is given that diagnosis, what do you do? Okay, if you have some eye disease, um, do we operate on you? Do we observe you? Do we use some medical therapy? Um, if you have cancer, uh, do you... Um, uh, go into chemotherapy and radiation therapy and have some increased life expectancy, uh, but potentially decreased quality of life versus do you go into hospice care and, you know, enjoy time with your friends and family. I mean, those are things that um, uh, aren't diagnostic. They're the art of medicine and they're sort of patient management. And, um, you know, I hope that these technologies um, and the science um, that we help promote um, can be a mechanism for ultimately helping doctors um, uh, take advantage of those, deliver better care, and also uh, devote more attention to the art, you know, of medicine. So that, that's how I see these things, you know, really fitting together and sort of complementing each other. Well, it's a, a very inspiring vision for the future, Mike. Um, you know, I think that I speak for a lot of ophthalmologists and, and healthcare workers that that it is uh, challenging to have enough time and energy to to be uh, doing the best arts and being the best um, caretaker of your patients and having these tools kind of simplify and standardize and kind of rein in some of those technical challenges and let us do more of the what might have been called in the past just simple doctoring sounds like a really appealing future. So, as usual, Mike, when I I talk to you, I'm both educated and inspired. Um, so I appreciate your time uh, this afternoon. Um, I think that's our last question. If you have any uh, final comments, we welcome those. Um, otherwise, uh, thanks again for your time. Um, any parting words, Mike, before we let you go? Uh, Mitch, thank you um, so much for having me on. And, um, you know, really thanks for the work that you do. Uh, I think that, um, uh, you know, we have a lot of challenges in terms of uh, delivery and accessibility of eye care. And I think that you and groups like Vision 2020, uh, you know, have done a lot and have potential to do obviously more involving trying to improve that delivery uh, and, you know, just coming up with ways that we can work together to improve, um, you know, eye care in this country. Mm -hmm.
Well, thanks for those kind words, Mike, and, and I'm sure Vision 2020 USA and our coalition members will be happy to work with uh, you and the National Institutes and your colleagues to further ourselves toward that goal. So thanks again, Mike, and appreciate your time and have a nice rest of yes. the afternoon. Thanks, Mitch. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Bye-bye now.